Hi everyone, uh, it's Mr. Smith here shooting another video lesson in our Transcendental Functions unit. <clears throat> so today we're going to play around with uh, exponential functions a little bit, do some applications, <clears throat> sketch a curve, let's get started. So, <clears throat> so to start off, I uh, just want to <clears throat> I'll remind you guys um, the derivative of the exponential function e to the power of x. We'll be working a lot with that today. e, the natural number, uh, Euler's number, uh, we have talked about that is uh, a special number such that the derivative of that e to the power of x is itself e to the power of x. So we're, we're going to be making use of that today. So we're going to talk about how today exponential modeling can help us model things like depreciation. Um, and uh, we're going to do a bit of practice applying the rules of differentiation and sketch a curve together as well. Um, so uh, let's uh, dive in. So you could almost treat this as a bit of a warm up. Um, we now know the derivative of e to the power of x is itself, and b to the power of x is b to the power of x times ln b. So if you want to try these five derivatives on your own as a bit of a warm up, you can uh, uh, do that. Pause the video, unpause when you're ready. Or you can follow along as uh, I do them here. So for part A, uh, we're using the product rule. So differentiate the first one, leave the second, plus leave the first x, and the derivative of e to the power of x is e to the power of x. And uh, you can actually factor out e to the power of x here and be left with 1 plus x or x plus 1. That's useful because if I was setting that equal to zero, I'd see an easy solution would be negative one. Let's look at B. So B is an exponential function where the exponent is a function itself. We'll have to use the chain rule. So for B, the derivative of that exponential function is itself. And because the base is E, I don't need to multiply by ln E. Like I know that ln E is one. So just E to the power of two X plus one. And now I have to multiply by the derivative of what's in the exponent, which is just 2. So um, 2e to the power of 2x plus 1. So pretty straightforward one. Uh, for part c, we just have the sum, or in this case, a difference of two functions. So to, I'll just switch up my notation just for fun. dy by dx, the derivative of the first, e to the power of x, is itself minus the derivative of e to the power of negative x is e to the power of negative x, but times negative one, the derivative of the function in the exponent. And uh, what we're left with is e to the x plus e to the power of uh, negative x. Uh, for d, we're using the uh, product rule again. This time though, we're mixing in exponential functions and uh, trig functions. For d, so I'll treat my first function as maybe two to the, two times e to the x. The derivative of that is itself, two e to the x, leave the second guy, uh, plus uh, leave the first function alone, two e to the power of x, and the derivative of cosine we know is minus sine. I can factor out two times e to the power of x, and I'm left with cosine x minus sine x. Again, useful to factor that out because I can set cos x minus sin x equal to zero, solve that equation, and figure out where my local max and mins are for that function. Uh, let's do E up here. Uh, I'll mix up my notation just for fun. So uh, another product rule, differentiate the first function. That's just 2x. 2x times 10 to the power of x plus leave the first function x squared. And we know the derivative of 10 to the power of x is itself. This is an e. Its base is 10, so I have to multiply by the ln of 10, the natural logarithm. Um, and that's that. There is some factoring we can do. Uh, there, each uh, term there does have an x and an exponential 10 to the power of x, uh, leaving 2 plus we have an x and then ln 10 from the uh, last one. And again, factored so that we can easily set that to 0 and solve. So almost a little warm up, five derivatives, mixing in all the rules you've been learning. Let's do a little application problem here. Um, in this case, an application involving exponential function where the base is uh, Euler's number e. 
So uh, Loris just bought a new motorcycle and the value of the motorcycle depreciates over time. So in this case, we're modeling the value with a decreasing exponential. So this is one way of modeling uh, depreciation. Other ways uh, do exist, uh, but here we're saying that every, every year goes down by a certain chunk. So that the value of the motorcycle will never be zero, but it loses less and less of its value over time. Um, in part A, we're gonna find the rate that the value of the motorcycle is depreciating uh, the instant it drives off the dealer's lot. So you might've heard like a car loses half its value as soon as you drive it off the lot. Well, according to this model, let's see what that would look like. So the rate implies we're finding the derivative. So we're finding V prime at T or DV by DT. Um, we have our constant of 10,000, doesn't affect the derivative. The base is E here. So the derivative is just E to the minus T over four but we do have to multiply by the derivative of what's in the exponent, um, which in this case is negative one over four. That gives us negative 2,500 e to the power of minus t over four. Now, if we want to find the rate of depreciation when she drives it off the lot, we'll find that initial value zero, plug in zero, and we get minus 2,500 e to the power of negative zero over four. Well, that's just zero and anything to the power of zero is one, um, any non-zero base anyway. So we just get minus 2,500. And uh, the V is in uh, dollars and our T is in years. So this is dollars per year. So kind of right off the bat, you can see that it's gonna, it's uh, depreciating by quite a lot, maybe not half its value, but according to this, the, this setup of the problem, um, it's already depreciating at a rate of $2,500 per year. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, let's look at another part of this question here. So uh, Laura is deciding that she's going to stop uh, insuring the motorcycle for collision once it's one quarter of its initial value. So once it's reached um, one quarter, yellow is not a good choice for this part. So one quarter of its initial value would be $2,500. Because um, you have to pay to insure your vehicle and you want to make sure like if you're in a collision and you were um, uh, responsible that, you know, you want to don't want to have to pay all that um, out of pocket. Um, but, you know, once the vehicle gets down to a certain point, you don't need as much coverage. You still need coverage, um, but you might not need um, coverage for collision, meaning like if you're... Um, motorcycle is not worth very much. It's not really worth paying hundreds or a few, a few hundred dollars a month to um, uh, just in case you get in a crash because your, your motorcycle is only worth 2,500, right? If you're paying $2,000 every year in insurance um, for something that's only worth $2,500, that doesn't seem like uh, a great decision, but anyway. So uh, we are gonna find out when she should stop her collision coverage. So we are asked to find a time here, we're solving an exponential, um, an exponential equation. So recall that the model for the value of our motorcycle was 10,000 times e to the minus t over four. And I just wanna actually double check that before I get too far in, yes, that's good. And so we're asking, we're trying to find when is that uh, value of the car going to be a quarter of its value, $2,500. dollars we are looking for T. And we use the skills we've been reviewing and learning to do that. So um, if I divide both sides by uh, 10,000, I get 0 0.25 equals E to the minus T over 4. Uh, to get at that exponent, I will take the natural logarithm ln of both sides because now we can use our rule of bringing that exponent down out front of the logarithm. So minus t over four times the ln of e. Um, of course, the ln of e is just one. So if you don't want to write that down, that's okay, but that's just equal to one. And essentially we've isolated t. We just have to multiply by four and uh, take the negative. So t is equal to the negative of four times the ln of 0 0.25, whatever that is. 
So let's actually uh, calculate that. Um, you'll see you will get a positive value because the ln of something below uh, e is going to give you a negative a negative number. So negative four times the ln of 0.25. So it looks like about five and a half years. So in about five and a half years, the motorcycle will be worth about $2,500. And then lower is going to feel like it's may maybe not worth paying this uh, money for the collision coverage. Um, and our, the last part of this problem, at what rate is the motorcycle depreciating at this time? Uh, so we um, have the derivative and we have the time. So we're going to be plugging uh, five, about 5.5 into the value of our derivative here. So let's do that on this page. So just to get this down, V prime we got was uh, negative 2,500 times e to the power of minus t over four. I am just going to double check that. And we're finding the rate of depreciation at this point. So before we even do any uh, calculations, we're expecting the rate of depreciation to be um, a lot lower than minus 2,500. Um, that's what we got, 5.5 over 4. So just going back to the original slide, with depreciation of vehicles and most things that depreciate, the things drop by a lot initially and drop by less and less over time. So by five and a half years, the motorcycle is still losing value, but it's kind of a shallow curve. So it won't be dropping that much in value year after year. So let's see exactly what that is. Uh, you could uh, do this all in one step if you'd like. I don't think I would prefer to do that. So I'm gonna do uh, 5.5 divided by four first. And, and this is approximate, right? Because 5.5 wasn't um, an exact value, so we're getting an exact, uh, we're getting a, a rough value here. Uh, so uh, 2,500 times e to the power of negative 1.375. So at this point, it's only decreasing value in value by about uh, $632 per year at this point. Uh, so a little application problem, tying in our knowledge of exponential functions when the base is e. Um, uh, the last thing we're going to do today is a uh, sketch a curve. Um, this is be the first uh, curve we sketch uh, that involves a mix of polynomials and transcendental functions. So we're going to sketch the function x squared times e to the power of x. And I've given you some prompts. Now, if you'd like to just pause and actually just try this out for yourself, um, bring up this function on a graphing program and kind of check your answers as you go. That's fine. If you want to just follow along with me, that's fine too. And then full disclosure for uh, some of these questions that are kind of just like computational, I've just uh, taken my solutions from a, the time I've did this in the past and I just have them as a little screen grab just, uh, just because I was feeling lazy. So um, yeah, let's use our algorithm for curve sketching to uh, see what this graph looks like. So to start off, um, let's find the intercepts. So for the y-intercept, we're looking for uh, what the y value is when uh, x is equal to zero. So we get zero squared times e to the power of zero. That's zero times one, and we get we get zero. Uh, so the y-intercept is zero zero. Um, this is the only x-intercept as well. <coughs> for some of you, that might be intuitive. Um, but uh, I'm going to just maybe show a bit more and just have a quick talk about why that's the only x-intercept. So you guys know from solving by factoring, you can solve an equation by you know setting each factor to zero. So clearly if you set x squared equal to zero, that's where our x-intercept of zero, zero comes from. Um, if you try setting e to the power of x equal to zero, and I'm uh, doing this because uh, some students have a misconception that you get some zeros from exponential bits like this. Um, but, you know, when does e to the x equal to zero? Well, you know, since your grade 11 year, we've been kind of trying to, uh, to drill properties of exponential functions into you guys. But the exponential functions like this, like some base to the power of x, are never zero. 
right? They get really close to zero, but they actually never get there, right? So the only x-intercept we have is zero, zero. So all that to show that zero, zero is the only intercept. That was a lot of work to show that. Um, wasn't necessary, but I wanted to talk about that with you guys. Um, so yeah, when you have a, some exponential that's a factor, don't waste your time setting it to zero. You're, you're not going to get any solutions. There's no way that some base e, some power can give you zero. Um, so those are the intercepts. Um, I'm going to, uh, uh, I'll add those on later because I think I have some work I don't want to tease. So that you can add that to your graph, zero, zero. That's an easy point to add on. Um, all right, let's talk about asymptotes. Now, there, there's no vertical asymptote here. This is an irrational function. Um, so the, the domain for this function is x can be any real number. You can plug in negatives, zero, big positives, everything will work. So there's no vertical asymptote. But there is a horizontal asymptote. So just, let's talk about what happens as x approaches. I'll write the positive in here. Uh, if I didn't, it'd be implied. But let's just do positive infinity of x squared times e to the x. And we're just going to think about this for a second. Um, as x gets really big, x squared gets really big too, even more big. And as x gets really big, e to the power of x, that's an exponential. That's getting really big too. So, you know, both these things are are, are growing um, at a very, very fast rate and getting really big. So hopefully it's kind of intuitive to you guys that um, as x approaches positive infinity, the y values approach positive infinity too. They're going to they're gonna shoot up like that as x gets big. Um, um, maybe that's not rigorous notation, but that's okay. We're just, we're in grade 12 right now. It's okay just to have that loose discussion there. But what happens as X approaches negative infinity? Because, you know, um, uh, the square of a really big negative number is a really big positive number. So that's getting really, really big, but e to the power of x is approaching zero. That's getting small, getting close to zero. So is it going to grow uncontrollably or is it going to equal to zero? So that's actually a very interesting discussion. And some, in some cases, it could be a different answer. Right for us, I'm just going to have you guys plug in some values. Try some big negative numbers, like negative 100, negative 1,000. I think you'll get the idea. Uh, if you want to pause that and try it right now, or if you're just ready for the final answer, you're going to see that actually <clears throat> e to the power of x gets closer to zero than x squared shoots up and grows uncontrollably. Those numbers actually do get smaller and smaller. And so we do have a horizontal asymptote um, at um, y equals zero. So just like your classic exponential function, um, we'll have an x-intercept or we'll have a horizontal asymptote the tail as it goes down to minus infinity, um, this graph will have that too. So a little reasoning there. Again, not so much rigorous discussion, um, but uh, hopefully you're convinced that, yeah, those values get close to zero. You might learn some tools for evaluating those kind of limits in a later math course. But let's do C. So if we want to find max and mins and flexion points, we need the derivatives. These aren't too bad to find, and they're not too bad to do quickly with you guys as well. So I'll, I'll do that. So f prime at x. So we're using the product rule, differentiate the first, leave the second, uh, plus leave the first, differentiate the second, which is e to the x. This is easy to factor. We have an x from each, we have an e to the x from each, and we're left with two plus x. Um, so, uh, you guys are going to do this in a second, but look at how factoring makes things easy. When you're setting this to zero, you've got a factor of x. You've got a factor of 2 plus x. That's going to give you two critical points. And again, nothing makes e to the power of x equal to, um, I don't need to erase those. It's fine. Uh, equal to zero. So there's the first derivative. Um, for the second derivative, uh, personally, I think it'd be easier for me. I'm going to differentiate uh, the, I'm going to find the second derivative using the first line of the derivative here. Um, that's just me. And then we'll factor afterwards. Uh, you could use the simplified version we have, but I'm not sure it's any less work. Maybe it might be more work. 
Um, but let's do that. So I have two product rules to do because I have two x e to the x, got to use the product rule, and x squared e to the x, got to use the product rule again. So I'll have 2 times e to the x plus 2x times e to the power of x. That's just differentiating the first guy. Now the second, differentiate the first 2x, e to the power of x, plus leave the first guy, x squared, e to the power of x. Um, I can group some things together. So I have an x squared e to the x term. I'll have actually 4x e to the x. And I'll have 2 e to the x. And I can factor out that exponential. And remember, nothing makes that 0. So when I'm searching for inflection points, it's actually not so bad. I just have to solve this quadratic equation, right? x squared plus 4x plus 2 equal to 0. Um, all right, so we're now ready to find some critical points. So for part D, you have the derivative, set it to zero, we've already done. Uh, well, we we've, we factored, so it's ready for you to set to zero and solve. Find the classical points, find the, or the critical points. Um, so find those critical numbers, there's gonna be two of them. Find their Y values and use the second derivative to see if you can classify them as a local max or min. If you wanna pause the video and try that, uh, go for it and then unpause when you're ready because I'm going to flip to my next slide where I have that work done already. So uh, we have our first derivative set to zero. So the factor of X here gives a solution of X equals zero. Remember nothing makes E to the X equal to zero and setting two plus X equal to zero gives us a, a solution of negative two. So two critical numbers. We already know the Y value when X is zero, it was zero. If you plug in zero into the second derivative, you get two. And because that's positive, it's concave. Remember, that would mean that at that point, the function's concave up. So zero, zero is a local minimum. If you want to add that little bit of detail to your graph, you can do that. We know there should be a mi local minimum there. When x is negative two, um, I don't expect you to leave this in, uh, as a, an exact value, but you get four over e squared or four e to the minus two as the value of the function. As a decimal, if you're trying to graph that, it's about 0.54. So that's the y value of that point. Move my face for a second here. The second derivative, when you plug in negative two, as a decimal, we don't really care what the value is, we care about the sign. You do get negative 0.27, which means that point is a local uh, maximum. So if you wanna add that detail to your graph as well. So if we think about it, there's some point between minus two and zero where the graph goes from concave down to up. So we expect to find um, at least one inflection point. Um, so let's carry on. Next slide. So determine inflection points. So you guys have the second derivative. Um, set it to zero. See if you can get any solutions. Again, unpause when you're ready because I'm gonna flip to the next slide where I have this done already. Um, so the, uh, the second derivative, uh, was, will green show up here? I think it will, um, e to the power of x times x squared plus 4x plus 2, and we're setting that to 0. Of course, nothing makes that equal to 0. You're just solving that quadratic equation, and I just quickly got the quadratic formula up here. Um, you do get two solutions negative 0.59, which is between our local max and min, little inflection point, which we expected. You also get an inflection point at about negative 0.341. Um, and you guys can use your calculator, get those decimal values for the Y values of those two points. Um, and then let's flip to actually making a sketch and put it all together. Um, I have it here. So let's talk about all the things we found from A to, from A to E. So in part A, we found that the only intercept was here at zero, zero. And we uh, talked about asymptotes. We talked about how the graph is gonna shoot towards positive infinity when X gets really big, but actually levels off as X gets really big in a negative sense. So there's our horizontal asymptote at uh, Y equals zero. And then we found the derivative and got critical points. So you guys found two. Uh, zero, zero, you guys showed was a local min, and then um, the point uh, negative two, 0 0.54, I think it was 0 0.54, was a local max. 
And then you guys found inflection points and you found there were two. There was one in between. I think that value was uh, negative 0.5. I'm going to actually double check. Uh, negative 0.59. And whatever you got for that Y value, it looks like a bit less than 0.5. And then you got another one at about negative 3.41. <laughs> and whatever you got for that y value there another inflection point and putting together all those pieces that's what our graph looks like um so it's a pretty interesting uh, pretty cool looking function um maybe something we haven't quite worked with before um hope that made sense to you guys as we chunked it down and put it all together at the end of course my recommendation to you guys has always been when you're sketching a function by hand sketch it on a graphing program first so that you kind of know what to expect so if you're doing that on your own Hopefully you could have been verifying all of those steps along the way. Um, for our next steps, uh, as usual, I've just got some suggested practice for you guys to, to work through with video solutions on the, on the classroom. Um, I've got uh, just uh, one more lesson to do in this unit. I'll likely probably make that, I am feeling pretty motivated to get lessons done. So I'm kind of working ahead. I'll probably get one more posted this week and then we'll have some, I'll have some review posted. And then uh, some kind of assessment for uh, this third unit. Um, I don't believe that I'll be able to include this on any midterm uh, midterm mark. <clears throat> uh, I I did uh, email you guys what your mark was pre March break. Some of you guys have emailed back, and we've talked about um, um, what your mark might look like. Um, I will give you a second update um, uh, when I mark your second unit assessment. And factor that into your mark. Um, uh, just remember, even if you even if you do uh, worse on this next test, and it brings your uh, your mark down in my grade book in my mark book, uh, remember that you know even if um, even if your mark goes down after the unit two assessment, for, as far as reporting goes, your mark will never be reported less than that first that mark from pre March break, right? So. Um, there, you shouldn't be uh, you shouldn't be stressed. You should just be trying your best, doing the practice. Um, there, you really have nothing to lose. Just practice hard and just try your best, and you should be stress free. Um, so uh, please let me know if you need anything. Uh, some of you guys have emailed me with um, just concerns about you know, conditional acceptances and stuff, and I want to make sure that I work with uh, work with you on that to make sure that everything is fine and there's no stress for you. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm rambling. So, uh, we'll see you guys soon. Have a great day.